Hello everyone, uh, welcome to the third of this four-part series of Meet the Researchers. These are events that have been created by the alumni and development team in partnership with the Center for Immersive Technologies. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, the course of this series, we're meeting researchers who are working with state-of-the-art virtual and augmented reality technology here at the university. And my name is Faisal Mashtak. I'm an associate professor in the School of Psychology and the Associate Director for the Centre for Immersive Technologies. So <clears throat> I'm your host for this evening and for this series, uh, a series where we've been covering a, a diverse range of content, covering some of the biggest issues in society today. Um, last week, if you were able to join us or able to catch up with the videos afterwards, uh, we, we focused on healthcare and education. And tonight we're talking about cultural engagement. And on Thursday, we're gonna wrap up with the topic of climate change, so obviously highly topical right now. Uh, now the common thread across all of these areas is how new, truly, really transformative technologies, AR, VR, XR, uh, which really seem to be the, the future of human computer interaction are being applied to solve some of the biggest challenges in society today. And the mechanism by which we're doing this is the Center for Immersive Technologies, which is a cross-cutting interdisciplinary research center that since its launch in 2019 has become established as a, a pioneer in high quality, responsible and critical uh, research on immersive. And what you're going to hear tonight, some really powerful ways in which this technology can be used to access and engage with sites of cultural and historical significance. Now, before I introduce uh, our speaker for this evening, I've got a few technical points uh, that I need to cover. Uh, the first is that there's going to be plenty of time for questions at the end of the presentation, uh, but you can submit your questions at any point uh, during this talk, or we'll cover those afterwards. There's a Q&A set of function at the bottom of your screens. Um, and you can also upvote other people's questions. So if you happen to sort of see one you really like and you want to see uh, our speaker answer them, then please sort of hit the upvote section. Um, we've also had some pre-submitted questions, so thank you very much to those of you who entered those, and we'll try and get to as many of those as possible as well at the end. Um, and then finally, this webinar is being recorded. So if anybody happens to have to leave early, uh, that's fine. The recording will be shared with you uh, in the next couple of days. So now I'd like to introduce and welcome our speaker today, uh, Dr. Tom Jackson. Uh, Tom joined the School of Media and Communications in 20, uh, 2012. Uh, where he's been contributing to this internationally renowned Centre for Teaching and Research in Communication here and Culture. Uh, Tom is a lecturer in digital media. He also is the academic lead for cultural engagement within the Centre for Immersive Technologies. And um, even though I've known Tom now for quite a few years, we haven't actually sat down to actually talk about his research. So I'm really excited to sort of uh, hear, uh, hear what he's got to say. So I'm going to hand over uh, to Tom now, and he'll talk us through his uh, his projects. Thank you very much for that uh, excellent introduction, Fezzel. Uh, yeah, now is the time. Let's uh, let's talk about uh, some of my uh, research. So I'm just going to set up my uh, screen sharing. If you just uh, bear with me very briefly, so that should be that uh, working now, and just uh, start my timer, and then uh, I think we're uh, we're good to go. So uh, as you've just heard, uh, I'm Tom Jackson and I'm an academic lead with the Centre for Immersive Technologies and I'm heading up our theme related to cultural engagement. Now, whenever I say that I work with immersive technologies, uh, I tend to get two very different responses. Uh, the first is, unsurprisingly, uh, I guess that I have no idea what you're talking about. Uh, the second is the assumption that when I say immersive technologies, what I actually mean is virtual reality. However, I thought a really nice start to um, this session this evening would be just to make sure everybody understands that uh, at the Centre for Immersive Technologies, we have a very broad and inclusive understanding of what an immersive technology might be. We do projects, for instance, around immersive and embodied audio recording. Can we create immersive experiences through sound and listening alone? Uh, we have a really exciting project that's trying to bring the first 360 degree full dome cinema to Yorkshire. And we're really excited about this idea 
of that uh, as an immersive technology which can be shared amongst large uh, groups of people. We create browser-based immersive experiences, projects that maximize how many people can access them because they run through standard web browser technology rather than, rather than relying upon access to a VR headset. However, uh, I guess this talk is very much focused upon fairly conventional VR work. And what I mean by that is virtual representations of space, place and objects through digital technologies. Now, in terms of the format of the presentation, I'm going to address three ways in which museums and other sites of cultural and historical significance might engage immersive technologies as a way of deepening visitor understanding. I do want to talk about how transformative those technologies might be, but as an academic, it is, of course, part of my job to critique and to problematize as well. So this will not be an overly technologically optimistic presentation. I do want to talk about some of the problems uh, that these new immersive technologies might um, introduce. Uh, all three of these approaches that I'm going to discuss during this presentation are illustrated through projects that I have made myself. So I'm somebody who considers themselves a, a practice researcher. And what I mean by that is I'm somebody who makes contributions to knowledge through the design, implementation and evaluation of practical projects. I'm not someone who simply critiques the work of others. Uh, I argue that I can provide unique insights as the originator of these projects. Okay. So these are the three areas that I'd like to focus on uh, in this presentation this evening. There are, of course, many different things that we could have uh, talked about uh, during uh, this presentation, but these are things which are very much recurring themes in the projects that I'm involved with right now. And they're things that feel really timely and important too. So the first is this idea of using immersive technologies as a way of providing visitors with forms of virtual access to otherwise inaccessible spaces and objects. The second is the idea of using immersive technologies as a tool for the preservation of different forms of testimony. And finally, allowing visitors to deepen their understanding of museums and other sites of cultural and uh, historical significance through technologies that might facilitate a kind of connected thinking. Okay, so let's start with this idea of virtual access, uh, first of all, and let's launch our first project. Okay, so this is a prototype project that was uh, created in collaboration with the Science Museum Group. What we have here is a project that provides users with virtual access to the otherwise inaccessible Blythe House stores in London. What you're seeing here is the web-based version of the project uh, in line with the idea of maximizing that access, uh, but it is also available via VR headsets uh, too. I'd like to show you the kind of visual resolution that the objects within the archive have. If we're particularly interested in interrogating these skulls here, hopefully you can see the kind of visual resolution that we have uh, within this. Uh, project. However, you'll see here that it is not just the objects that have been captured. This project also communicates an experience of the archival space. And I'm really interested in how this might provide ways of knowing about the processes involved in archiving objects and the role of the archivist. The main idea, though, is that this project is uh, around what it might mean for communities to be provided with virtual access to the archives that are intended to represent them. We need to understand and acknowledge that these archives are privileged spaces of knowledge production. And can we, through immersive technologies, start to democratize access to these spaces? What educational impact might it have for us to do that? How might community involvement in museum archives impact upon the shared identity of that community? These are some of the really important 
questions. Okay, moving on to another project. Now, a lot of my recent work has involved working with Holocaust memorial sites and museums around how immersive technologies might deepen visitor understandings of the narratives of the, the Holocaust. Now, this is a guard tower that is uh, located on the site at the Neuengamme Memorial site. This is a space that is completely inaccessible to public visitors, simply not safe to have visitors uh, accessing and entering this space. However, colleagues at Neuengamme insist that this perpetrator's perspective on the site has the potential to have a significant impact upon visitor understanding. Therefore, the tour guides now offer visitors this hybrid experience. They walk up to the guard tower when they're actually physically present on the site, but then continue that exploration through immersive technologies. For this next project, I'd like to go to a very important uh, building in Leeds. So uh, here we are. So I'm hoping some people on the call will uh, recognize uh, this space. This is, of course, the very famous Temple Works building uh, in South Leeds, a very important space in the history of the industrialization of the north of England. This is now also a space that's sadly only accessible via immersive technologies. The uh, decay of the building has now made it unsafe for, for people to um, enter. It's represented through similar technologies to those that you've already seen in the uh, previous projects, but it does have three qualities that I really want to emphasize to you uh, in this presentation. And the first is that the project is combining immersive visual data and also immersive and embodied audio data. If I head over to this space here, you should now also be able to hear the audio uh, of this space. And what I think is really interesting about the sound recording is it really starts to change your perception of the space. With the visual information alone, you might assume that this space is fairly inert and inanimate, but the audio reveals that this is far from true. Space clicks and creaks and groans and drips, and all of a sudden you realize how alive and animated it is. So part of my research agenda is really to challenge this visualism that I perceive in so many of our digital technologies and to advocate for the importance of other aspects of sensory experience. But I think one of the most significant contributions that can be made right now to the development of immersive technologies is to challenge this focus upon visual experience and to highlight how much knowledge and understanding is tied up with non-visual aspects of experience. Now, in terms of the second uh, feature of this project, it also allows the user to shift in time. So if we make our way over now to this studio of stained glass artist, Zoe Eady. Now you can see here we have the visual experience of her space, we also have an auditory experience of her working in this space. But during the time that I was creating this project, um, Zoe vacated the building. And when we click this button uh, down the bottom here, we can see that she disappears from the visual information and we can hear that her presence disappears from the auditory uh, information. Now, one of the really fascinating insights of this project, and one of these things that really could only have been revealed through this practical approach to research, was the completely unexpected emotional response Zoe had to the project. When she experienced her presence disappearing from the site in that really temporarily compressed format, it created a really strong emotional response uh, in her. That's something that I've really reflected on in my later work, the extent to which we can use different types of sensory experience to elicit um, different responses. Okay, and then finally, uh, in terms of this project, it also includes participatory features. So let me find the right space. 
here we go. So another motivation of my research right now um, is really to try and create virtual spaces that not only present data uh, to the users, but which can also become collaborative spaces of knowledge production. So anywhere in this project, in this room, when we're looking at these books here, any user can create their own textual inscriptions into the site. They can upload their own images, videos, uh, and sound recordings. And I'd like to show you now a really interesting example of how that uh, functionality was used and the kind of knowledge that it revealed. So I've walked through this reception area here hundreds of times, and so many times when I did so, I, I wondered who uh, this picture was, uh, who this picture is of uh, up here on the shelf. I actually wondered for a while if it was Michael Palin. You know, has Michael Palin been to, to Temple Works? But of course, uh, it, it isn't. Uh, and when the participatory functionality was added to the site, one of our uh, resident artists at Temple Works contributed this beautiful and intimate story of who this person is, how they knew them, and what they meant to them. And the thing that's really fascinating for me is they finished that story with, um, I've never told anybody that before. And following um, the development of this project, I published a chapter about this idea that immersive technologies don't have to be singular and isolated experiences. They can be participatory and collaborative spaces. I did say that I was going to problematize and critique as well though. So let's uh, do uh, some uh, of that. Now, the first thing that I'd really, really like to emphasize is that immersive technologies in no way recreate the experience of being there. Anybody who, who says any of these things like, it's just like being there, uh, I'm afraid is massively overstating what immersive technologies are currently capable of. The sensory experience we receive is always mediated, translated and reduced in ways that have the potential to change people's understanding. Now, as we increasingly reach out to virtual representations as a way of accessing and understanding the world, we need to be very conscious of the potential impact of these effects. If, for instance, that virtual representation of the guard tower at Neuengamme becomes the sole way of accessing that space, how might that specific representation change people's understanding. Next point is that um, although all of these technologies do, I argue, have the potential to disrupt the power relationships tied up with these privileged spaces, there is a wealth of research largely coming out of digital media, which suggests that these power imbalances and systems of structure and control that we face in our offline worlds are simply replicated in our interactions with the digital. So if somebody doesn't feel like they have a voice or the confidence to speak out in their uh, real offline world, it's a really dangerous assumption to, that they, to suggest that they will feel empowered to do so uh, in the digital. So I am, I am optimistic about these technologies. I would advise caution in assuming that immersive technologies will democratize access to and the use of these spaces. Okay, I'd now like to move on to this idea of preservation uh, through another uh, project. This is another collaboration with the Science Museum group, and this is a virtual representation of the agricultural gallery uh, at the Science Museum uh, before it was dismantled. Now, not only was this space due to be dismantled and all of the objects uh, removed, but the curators knew that all of these wonderful dioramas that are included throughout uh, the exhibition simply could not be transported. The minute that anybody attempts to dismantle them, they are so fragile that they uh, fall apart. So this project uh, was devised in which all of this would be mapped uh, and preserved. Why preserve the actual layout of the gallery space itself though? Why not simply digitize each of the objects and each individual diorama? The reason is because there's so much knowledge tied up 
with the spatial layout of the exhibition. The curators have obviously spent a lot of time very carefully considering how these objects are spatially arranged in order to communicate specific narratives and specific meanings. And the immersive technologies have the uh, potential to preserve that. The next example project, we're going to go back to uh, Neuengamme, and this time we're going to have a, a look at their brickworks. So this is another, uh, as you can see, very large space at the Neuengamme uh, memorial site. It also contains immersive audio. Uh, I have paused uh, that immersive audio uh, for the purposes of this uh, presentation. Uh, but it really does, again, help to communicate the material and spatial qualities of the building. Now, the aim of these projects is, of course, to deepen visitor understanding of the narratives of the Holocaust. Now, I would argue that there are already fantastic projects which focus on the human testimony. Projects like the Forever Project and New Dimensions in Testimony are really trying to preserve the human testimony surrounding the Holocaust. This project's more about the material testimony sedimented into the sites themselves, which of course also will not last forever. The virtual experience combines archival materials, letters, photographs, objects are brought into the virtual space for uh, visitors to uh, access. And that's a really nice example of replicating something that just works so well in the real world, in the virtual. Tour guides use objects to illustrate particular meanings to visitors, so the virtual project uh, does the same. Okay, and then finally, uh, in this section, I'd like to show you another prototype project. Uh, this one is being developed in collaboration with the Brotherton Special Collections uh, at the University of Leeds. Uh, this project is an attempt to both preserve and provide access to this wonderful medieval manuscript. So there's two reasons why I wanted to show you this piece of work. Uh, firstly, it's an object rather than a space, and it's obviously important to realise that we can use immersive technologies for the preservation and presentation of objects as well as spaces. And it illustrates to me that sometimes we don't always want to present things in ways that replicate our lived experience. It might be that we want to create an immersive technology that does try and recreate that sense of being there. We might want to present things in completely novel ways, ways that aren't otherwise possible. So if you actually go to the Brotherton Special Collections and you have this manuscript in front of you, you can only look at a small piece at a time. It's incredibly long. In fact, if I click on the middle marker here, this will just give you a sense of the size of it when you, you just see half of the uh, manuscript uh, in one. It's a huge thing and it's very fragile. It cannot be unraveled for visitors to look at um, all at the same time. But through the uh, immersive uh, experience, uh, we can. So should immersive representations used at sites of cultural and historical significance attempt to recreate the lived experience, or should they offer completely new and novel ways of interacting with the space and the object? Okay, talking about some problems uh, again now though. Okay, so the first thing that I would say is that virtual representations of space are far from neutral in spite of the fact that most visitors will probably not appreciate that. So when we access uh, a space uh, like this, we might think that the ability to freely move around the environment and to interact with it in the ways that we want to um, means that it is a neutral representation uh, of this space. But actually, this is a particular subjective and embodied experience that the project uh, reflects. And if we hope to use these technologies to preserve these kind of sites, then we need to be very aware of the ethical implications of this, itch, of this issue that these representations are far from neutral. As I use my camera and my audio recording equipment to create this virtual environment, I really quickly came to appreciate the extent to which all of the resulting materials and the resulting experience 
was going to be reflective of my own agency and intentionality as the author uh, of them. This really then begs the question, when we create virtual environments of any sort, whose subjective and embodied perspective does the resulting project represent? When we start to bring uh, materials into the uh, virtual environment that we did not generate ourselves, then this also makes this issue even more uh, entangled. During this virtual Holocaust project, I was very conscious that we were bringing archival materials into the virtual space. But of course, those archival materials are largely created by the perpetrators of the Holocaust. So we need to be very careful that we don't end up recreating those perpetrator perspectives in our modern day representation um, of the space. So these again are some of the, the really kind of critical and important questions that I think that we need to uh, engage with if we're going to create these sorts of uh, projects. Okay. Um, I think another important concern is communicated very nicely in this expression that I, I, I must attribute to my colleague Simon Popple. He termed this uh, wonderful phrase uh, that immersive technologies might be both seductive and reductive. So we might find this immersive experience incredibly alluring, but is it actually providing us with quite a limited representation of the space? If we're trying to deepen visitor understanding, is there something about this singular and unified experience that is somewhat troubling? And finally, I just want to talk about this idea of using immersive technologies as a way of facilitating connected uh, thinking. So here I'm really pointing towards what I hope will be the future uh, of these technologies, something that I really hope they're going to be capable of in the near future. So when I was creating these projects as part of the virtual Holocaust project, they were intended to be site specific. So I was making projects for Neuengamme that were for use by Neuengamme. I was making projects for Bergen-Belsen that were for use by Bergen-Belsen. But a really exciting and unexpected outcome of this work was that very quickly other sites uh, around Europe started to request access to the representations of other spaces. So this unexpected outcome has set into motion a whole new area of development that I hope to be exploring in 2022. How linking immersive representations of different sites together might allow visitors to gain a much more complex and newer and nuanced understanding of the narratives of the Holocaust. So let's just look very briefly at one uh, example uh, of this. This is a project that was created for uh, Vesterbork but which uses a contemporary immersive representation of Bergen-Belsen combined with survivor testimony. So what you should be uh, hearing now is that the kind of sounds of uh, modern day uh, Bergen-Belsen and then the uh, uh, audio testimony uh, of uh, this person who has all these insights into what the space uh, used to uh, be like. Okay. And then if we just very quickly uh, go back to my slides, we can see here, this is the project being used, being permanently installed as part of uh, an installation uh, at uh, Vesterbork. Uh, there are other sites doing this now. Museum 44 in Belgium has virtual reality headsets with the experience of Neuengamme installed um, in them. So I'm really excited to explore what kind of educational impact we might achieve by thinking of immersive experiences as a kind of connected knowledge exchange platform. Okay, time to wrap things up though. We're up to uh, 25 uh, minutes uh, now. Apologies if I've uh, slightly uh, overrun. Uh, I hope I have uh, inspired all of you to think about how transformative uh, immersive, te immersive technologies might be for sites of cultural and historical significance. But I also hope that I've highlighted some of the potential pitfalls and some of the ethical questions that need to be thoughtfully addressed. I'll now hand back over to Fezzel for the uh, questions and answers. Thank you. Ah, oh, Tom, thank you very much for a fantastic presentation. Uh, some incredibly powerful projects there. 
Um, so uh, before we kick off with the questions, I just remind everybody that there's a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can post questions. A few of you have already done that. Um, it's fantastic. Um, and you can upload others as well, so we can prioritize those uh, within our discussion with Tom. Um, so I'm going to kick off, uh, Tom, with something you just sort of ended on there. And Alan, uh, thank you, Alan, for your question. Has a you really hit the nail on the head. This is the question I wanted to ask you actually as well. So thank you, Alan. Uh, how have you approached the potential emotional, moral, and ethical issues and impacts of VR development and experience? You, you, you mentioned you've, told, you've thought a lot about this in the past. So it'd be great of you to hear, hear your thoughts on this. Yeah, no, thanks, Bez. And thank you, Alan. Yes, that is a really important and uh, timely question. So we, we had a project, Virtual Holocaust Memoryscapes, where we uh, trialled and evaluated a, a number of different immersive technologies, a number of different Holocaust memorial sites and museums uh, across uh, Europe. And all the way through the development of this work, as I'm sure you will all be able to appreciate, all of these really important ethical questions uh, came up, exactly the kind of questions that Alan uh, is talking uh, to there. How do we reflect the different needs and requirements of different types of visitors uh, to these sites? Uh, people go to a Holocaust memorial site for all kinds of different motivations. They might be paying tribute to a lost family member. They might simply be there for a touristic experience as part of their, their holiday. So these are all really, really difficult uh, questions for us to address. We need to think about the needs of different users. We need to think about the sensitivities of everybody's experience um, in that site. We need to make sure that the immersive technologies that we uh, introduce uh, enhance and, and deepen visitor understanding, that they don't actually create a barrier to people's engagement with the material uh, and physical uh, site. So, so Alan, my best answer to your question is that this is very much something that is in development, but every time we engage a new type of immersive technology in collaboration with a particular uh, partner organization like a Holocaust Memorial Site, we are absolutely thinking about these emotional, moral and ethical uh, issues and really trying to, to use these technologies in a, in a responsible way. And even to address things like the potential for these technologies to be misused uh, by others, we need to make sure that um, we um, moderate these sorts of platforms. Uh, so, so yeah, lots of, of things for us to think about there. Yes, you're absolutely right, uh, Alan. And um, yeah, hopefully uh, we will soon have, uh, through this work coming in, in 2022, an even more clearly defined set of, of sort of guidelines and, and considerations for the uh, ethical use of immersive technologies at, at these kinds of, uh, of sites. That's, thanks for the question, it's really, really interesting. Yeah, thank you, Alan, for fascinating. Uh, um, it actually sort of, Tom, it speaks to a, an issue in the VR world that I see sort of more generally, is this blindly applying VR, AR, or whatever that might be, just because you can. And I guess what you've been pushing back on is, is really thinking through doing this sort of responsibly. And that's something you've been a sort of strong advocate for ever since I've known you. So uh, uh, this is a really great example of that. Um, I have a, a question that leads on really nicely uh, from Alan's, which is around audience responses to this type of activity. Uh, and does it increase their engagement understanding? Um, and I guess that the question probably there I'm, I'm leading on to is relative to sort of your know, real world sort of experiences too. So. Yeah. Yeah, again, this is something which is um, a real challenge uh, in this kind of work. Uh, we are trying to increase visitor engagement. We are trying to deepen visitor understanding. We are trying to create tools that allow people to complicate the, the narratives rather than um, simplify them. And yes, we, we need to work with audiences to, to evaluate um, how these things work. So in the Nine Gamma project, there is a feedback form built into the project. We have been gathering uh, user feedback. We've been gathering uh, user responses to the project. Uh, those responses have been largely very positive. Uh, we have had some criticism uh, of the projects as well, which is completely understandable. I completely understand that some people might have the opinion that immersive technologies at a Holocaust memorial site 
is in some way trivializing or, or gamifying at this sort of space, which is, of course, absolutely not um, our intention. Uh, I've had the criticism before that, um, you know, you shouldn't be providing virtual access to a Holocaust memorial site. If people care about this, they should go, right? You know, go to the site and actually experience it. Now, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but also I'd say that's an incredibly privileged worldview. You know, not everybody can afford to fly to Germany and to travel out to the site and actually encounter it. So even if the immersive experience is somewhat um, reductive compared with the actual experience of being there, I, I hope and I believe that providing uh, school children around the world with at least some sense of what these sites represent and the knowledge contained within them it, it is better than, than nothing at all. Thank you, Tom. Um, the next or the mo most popular question comes from our very own Eric Thomason. Hi, Eric. Uh, it's good to have you here. Um, do you see a paradox in using exclusive, expensive technology to increase democratization and how this can be uh, best addressed without sacrificing quality of experience? Yeah, what a great question. Uh, yes, uh, I absolutely do see that paradox, Eric, you are absolutely <laughs> right. Uh, now, what I found is um, increasingly over the last, I've been working with immersive technologies in one form or another since about 2002, 2003. And like with the advent of most technologies, um, these things go in a, a kind of a, a, an arc, right, of, of development get peaks and troughs in the expectations regarding that uh, technology. So um, when the internet first came around, uh, all the websites were super small and compressed and had super low resolution files um, on them. And then broadband came out and everybody started uploading massive videos and images and interactive content on their sites because you could access it through broadband. Then the mobile phone comes out and then of course you start shrinking everything back down again it's got to work on a small screen and you might be on a 3g connection so again these kind of phases of development happen now that's absolutely happening again with immersive technologies when they first came out i think everybody was so excited about super high resolution super realistic graphics and sound um, that you, know, you could only access on the latest uh, technology. But Eric's point is, of course, here, that these technologies are exclusionary and uh, mm -hmm. super expensive. And now in the discussions with all of these partner organizations that I'm working with, I'm starting to see this trend again of trying to trim the technology back down again. Yes, we want this to be a really immersive experience, but it has to work on a really old laptop running an old browser without a fantastic graphics card it has to work on a on a mobile phone uh, i'm working with organizations now that are designing immersive experiences mobile first and then worrying about the vr headset uh, experience later on which again just kind of illustrates that shift in, in what we're, we're doing so it's a really great question, Eric. I hope that speaks to, to what you're, you're asking about um, in some way. Yes, we're very mindful um, of that problem. And yeah, this sort of latest uh, mobile and standard web browser type of immersive, immersive experience that we can create now is increasingly popular for all of the kind of reasons that you've uh, just, just outlined. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, so actually, I'm going to take advantage of my position of power here as host and sneak in one of my own questions uh, into this, because I think it leads on quite nicely so from what Eric was uh, uh, getting at. Uh, so in, in the presentation, Tom, you talked about power relationships um, and how those might be recreated in the virtual world. And, and I want to sort of put that in context with where the technology is going and how it's and who's driving forward the sort of technological advances. So you've got Facebook, Microsoft, etc. The sort of the tech monopolies uh, who are taking you know, who sort of have such big influence in the non-immersive world, and that's sort of uh, being transposed over there. So I just wanted to sort of get your thoughts uh, on that and how, how, if we can at all, reconcile these sort of uh, issues. 
yeah, again, really important, really timely issue, Fezzo. You, you, you're absolutely uh, right. Uh, at, at my heart, I'm a media and communication scholar, right? I'm in a school of media and communication. And when I first started in that school, one of the professors told me all media and communication research is basically about power relationships. Who has power over this media form and, and who mm -hmm. doesn't? And I think we're actually uh, at this point now where we're just really starting to tackle some of those questions around um, immersive. And I think some really interesting things for us to learn around the, the perception of immersive as an empowering technology, but your very astute point that actually do these big technological corporations actually have the, the power and that really we're just experiencing whatever content it is that they want to, to push to us. Uh, the best uh, solution I have right now to sort of pushing back uh, against those um, sorts of trends is this idea of, of collaborative experiences through uh, immersive. Really, I'm excited by this idea that uh, immersive uh, experiences can be co-designed, can be co-created. I don't necessarily put on a VR headset and experience what Facebook has told me that I should experience. I should be able to go into the space and make that space my own. I should be able to inscribe my own thoughts and feelings um, into it, and I should be able to upload my own content to it. With all those caveats, as I talked about in the presentation, about how we really must not assume that digital is necessarily democratizing and empowering. You know, everybody thought that social media was going to solve all of the social inequalities. It was going to be the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can all <laughs> safely assume that has not happened. And we yeah. need to be very careful about assuming the same will happen in immersive. Yeah, absolutely. So Elon Musk's uh, tweets can change the sort of a uh, course of the stock market. <laughs> Which is, uh... No comment on that one, Fezzel. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> doing that one. <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, well, it's actually a, a really nice sort of follow on on this. Uh, how can the practice of co-curation, as outlined in the Museum Sort of Association Code of Ethics, counter the concept that these spaces represent one subjective point of view? Yes, that's an interesting question, isn't it? The practice of co-curation. Yeah, lovely. So that, um, that uh, prototype project with the Science Museum resulted in this publication called uh, Strokes of Serendipity, um, uh, authored with uh, the wonderful Daniel Matibwa and Alison Hess of the, um, of the Science Museum. And in that, we really tried to, to tackle some of these questions around what it might mean if uh, museum archives and special collections and exhibitions were uh, co-curated. Because I think we need to accept the fact there is something a little bit strange about how if there's a, a collection somewhere in an archive that really represents my community, my lived experience, um, and yet it's being curated by, by somebody else, you know, why shouldn't I have a voice in the way in which that um, exhibition is curated? I might have really intimate and specialist knowledge of some of those uh, pieces of uh, equipment or, or things in the uh, archive. And we started to, to kind of point at this idea that maybe immersive will open up these spaces to um, new audiences and allow them to, to engage with them in those sorts of uh, ways. But yeah, again, we just need to think this, these things through. We need to think through what the unexpected outcomes of these technological innovations might be. So, you know, you know our uh, anonymous um, question uh, person, that's a very strange way of describing them, uh, has made reference to the Museum Association Code of Ethics, not something that I'm um, familiar with. But this is why interdisciplinary research is absolutely key uh, at this time. We need to bring in uh, specialists with that, that knowledge. So all of the work that I'm going to be doing next year around immersive technologies and the Holocaust, of course, I've collaborated with a, a, hol a Holocaust education specialist who brings that subject specific expertise. I bring the technological uh, and user experience design um, expertise. But this idea of the, um, the questions just moved. 
but yeah, the, the kind of subjective point of view. Yeah, really, really interesting for us to think through, as I said in my presentation, whose subjective and embodied perspective do the immersive technologies represent? And the, the possibility that a co-curated space might challenge that kind of singular and embodied uh, perspective. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you to our, our questioner. Um, we now have a, a few questions around implementation and some of the technological challenges. So I'm going to start off with Phil. Phil's got two questions. I'll, I'll start with the, the first one. Um, how easy is it to produce these types of experiences, these 3D or sometimes 4D uh, experiences? Uh, do you just need a fancy camera and a bit of running around the room? Or, or does it require sort of uh, some more specialist skills or a, a sort of team to, to put these things together? Yeah, great, uh, great question, Phil. Um, so one of the things I think is really exciting in immersive at the minute is that the technologies required to uh, create this sort of content are becoming increasingly consumer level and affordable. The idea that you can now have uh, an iPhone with a LiDAR scanner built into it is, is crazy. You know, it was five years ago, you were looking at sort of 20, 25,000 pounds for a a LiDAR scanner that would allow you to lay the scan and, and create immersive representations of a space or an object. Uh, now, this technology is, is in my pocket and that's really exciting. However, um, I would really counter that with the fact that it's not the technologies that make it a, a meaningful and um, a user experience that is positive. So I've seen all kinds of uh, immersive representations of space created through technologies such as uh, Matterport, which can create these really high resolution and three dimensional scans of a space. But it seems quite clear to me that the person who created that content hasn't considered the way in which people might naturally move around uh, a space. And then the resulting experience is quite, quite clunky and quite unintuitive and makes the user feel like that they're getting lost as they, they navigate through the, the spaces. So my best answer to that question, Phil, is that, you know, it's not necessarily terribly expensive anymore. The technologies are becoming more accessible, which is really exciting, but nothing will ever replace that learned experience of creating this sort of content. So I've been producing uh, those sort of 360 degree image based projects now for around 12 years. Uh, I must have shot three or 400,000 photographs in, in the creation of these sorts of uh, spaces. And that kind of tacit knowledge of where to place the camera uh, and what sort of exposure to use on the camera, these ways of knowing that are tied up in, in my embodied experience of creating those things cannot yet be replicated by the robots. And um, you know, if you wanna create these fantastic immersive experiences, it's that practice of producing them, evaluating them, um, and just learning how to do it uh, really well. That, that's the key uh, to doing it. Very easy to do, very hard to do well, I think would sort of be my mm. overarching answer to that. Yeah, yeah, so, so where Phil's actually going with this is, is his next question is around uh, Pink Floyd exhibitions and sort of the various sort of uh, uh, events of sort of cultural musical sort of significance and whether we could capture those uh, for posterity. Yeah, we absolutely can, Phil. And one of the ethical questions that I was going to include in my talk, but I, I completely ran out of time. So you've given me a perfect primer for, for bringing this in now, <laughs> Phil, thank you. Is one of the other ethical questions we need to ask is around our selection of what should be preserved. Because we have the technologies to preserve and create immersive experiences of spaces and objects, but, but what do we choose to, to represent? So I'm troubled by this idea of what some people refer to as salvage anthropology. You're only studying things because they're going to become extinct through processes of modernization and, and, and change. I can obviously understand the motivation to do that. And, and that was obviously part of the motivation for the agricultural gallery project. 
this thing is no longer going to exist. Let's save it. Let, let's make a version of it. But then you, know, you could argue that this obsession with salvaging something because it's going to disappear might be better replaced with let's use these same technologies to study things that aren't going to be extinct, that are still important in contemporary society. Maybe those are the things we should be focusing our efforts on rather than this thing that is uh, going to, to disappear. So yes, Phil, I think we could. Uh, you know, I'm inclined to say we probably should, but um, let's just avoid this temptation to start archiving and preserving things that are disappearing when maybe our efforts might be better focused on studying things which are still timely, relevant, and exist in, in sort of contemporary society, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Phil. Uh, very interesting questions. Um, Eric is back with another one which actually follows on again, very nicely from Phil's. Um, uh, the main hall of the National Railway Museum is, uh, is being redeveloped. And do you have any plans on capturing that? I do not, Eric, but let's make it happen. Yeah, <laughs> I think Eric, uh, <laughs> there might be a leading question there. Uh, <laughs> Eric's uh, uh, links in the sort of transport world. Um, yeah, Eric, I'm sure, I'm sure uh, we can arrange those conversations. Um, and and uh, transport related again, uh, Google Maps for the whole world. So we already have this. Um, and it seems that sort of a potentially the next level is to develop a, a fully immersive experience of the globe. Um, do you think that's that's possible anytime soon? So immersive experience of sites and buildings worldwide. Yeah, um, thanks very much for that for that question. Whoever posted it, um, I talk a lot about Google Maps and and Google technologies uh, in my presentations around immersive. And, and the reason that I talk about it is because to me, it absolutely embodies one of the things that I'm trying to, to challenge, which is this visualism that I perceive in um, contemporary digital technologies. So what you're um, suggesting, uh, anonymous person, sounds really exciting. You know, if we can use all of that image data and run it through some sort of photogrammetry uh, algorithm that creates a 3D model of the the planet, you know, really uh, exciting. And I think you're, you're right, completely uh, potentially possible, given the amount of visual data that we have. But the thing that I always ask my students and, and, and the kind of public audiences that I'm presenting to is to think about why are we so obsessed with that visual experience over our other sensory modalities? Why are Google so obsessively mapping the visual experience of the world not only from the road now, but they are sending people with 360 degree camera backpacks into the Taj Mahal and down the Grand Canyon. And you know, they want to have this visual representation of the whole planet. But what about the auditory experience of the world? What, why are we not doing the same thing with sound? Why are we not trying to, to map um, what it's like to drop down to street level in Hong Kong, not just see what it looks like there, but to hear what it sounds like there. You know, I, I will always argue that uh, sound may be the ultimate immersive technology. If we want people to experience another space or another moment in time, it's sound that has the greatest capacity to, to do that. So um, yeah, it's a really interesting idea and, and I support it, but also let's just stop with this obsession with the, with the visual data and start to embrace and acknowledge the the knowing the ways of knowing uh, and the immersive qualities of, of other aspects of our sensory experience uh, Tom, i just want to add to that so um so there's also a sensation of touch as well which which is another sort of a part of a, an immersive experience in the, in the physical world uh, which is something that we're struggling with uh, in, in the immersive side i want to sort of bring up a point that came up last week uh, in in uh, Ryan's uh, uh, sort of webinar uh, on, on healthcare and the sort of inclusivity of these technologies, uh, particularly when you start considering people with visual impairments. So if this is the next sort of, you know, form of human computer interaction, where does that leave people uh, with visual disabilities, all the kinds of disabilities that makes it hard to access these technologies? 
Yeah. Yeah, and just, yeah, your, your thoughts on that would be really appreciated. So I'll maybe just share a brief personal vignette, I think, that, that speaks to that question. Um, I was presenting my projects um, at a, um, a Common Grounds event uh, at the University of York a number of years ago. And um, a visitor uh, came up to me uh, where I was showing my, my projects. And uh, she had um, very serious uh, visual uh, impairment. And I just started chatting with her and saying, are, are you enjoying this, this exhibition of new, exciting digital technologies? And her response was, no, I can't engage with any of this. It's all about vision. I can't see the projects. I'm just not, you know, I'm not enjoying this at all. And I said to her, well, you know, I have this um, multi-sensory representation of a, a grade one listed building in, in Leeds and, and give us some uh, headphones. And uh, she was uh, interacting with that uh, building with the immersive sound recordings in it. And this absolute expression of glee spread across her face. And she started saying, finally, something here that's for me. And yeah, I think you're absolutely right that we need to, to think about this. You know, are these new contemporary technologies ableist uh, in, in any way? And how are we going to make them uh, inclusive? Uh, I have a project starting in January that's uh, going to run for three years. That's all going to be about how technology impacts on our health. And we really will be focusing on issues of ability uh, and disability and uh, access to technology. Uh, so uh, yeah, re really important and timely. And, and we're, we're really trying to tackle some of those questions. Thanks, Tom. So we're, we're uh, fast approaching 7 p.m., uh, but I think we have time for maybe one more question. But I'm going to take off Alan's question myself, actually, just before we, we head to that. So uh, Alan's asking about uh, immersive experiences in professional development of students and practitioners. Um, and Alan, I just want to point you to, if you haven't seen it already, Ryan Matthews' talk, uh, where he goes into some detail about how we're using uh, AR, VR in the healthcare sector uh, and to train our sort of uh, future sort of nurses and doctors. Uh, so I encourage you to check that out. Um, so our, our final question, that's all we have time for unfortunately, is around uh, the inclusion of, of people, avatars uh, in, in uh, virtual spaces. Uh, it seems a little peculiar or unrealistic, I guess, is, is, is where Eric's coming at this from. Um, so challenges there perhaps, um, opportunities? Absolutely. So um, this is probably the wrong thing to say as a representative of the Centre for Immersive Technologies, but I'm quite troubled by the very um, term immersive technologies, <laughs> you know, extent to which they are actually immersive. Um, I often prefer to use the term embodied technologies because whether or not they're immersive, I think is incredibly subjective. But I do think that people respond to these technologies in embodied ways that are very different to, to other sorts of, of technologies. So I'm more comfortable with that as a, as a way of describing what they are. However, I then start to really uh, struggle with the fact that I'm calling this an embodied technology. And then for most of these technologies, you, you look down and, and you don't have a body. So how can this be an embodied technology if you don't have a, a body? Um, there are some incredibly exciting innovations now um, in the real time mapping and projection of your actual body into virtual spaces. Uh, there are technologies now that in real time will 3D scan and project your, your body, your, your own body into a, a virtual environment. So it, it, it's coming, um, but the extent to which that will actually reflect the, the real sensory experience of being there, you know, with contemporary. Mm -hmm technologies is is a big question but yes it's, it's very um very interesting and, and important for us to think about the body but the body is so implicated in all of this work that we're doing how do we represent the body what different types of bodies and these are all just really important questions mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, just just add to that as a psychologist, something that we've we've known uh, about avatars and sort of trying to get realistic looking avatars is what even if they're just slightly off, um, uh, things start to look pretty weird. And it's called the the phenomenon is known as the uncanny valley. Uh, if you want to have a have a search around that, and you'll see if maybe you go on Google Images, you'll you'll see some uh, 
uh, pretty funny experiences there. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's again, one of these things that sort of whether, whether we should even go down that road is, a, is another sort of question. Um, so uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to wrap up, Tom. I've, I've really enjoyed this chat. I wish we could go on uh, for longer, but um, yeah, um, 701 it is. So I have to wrap up. I have to end by well, I was thanking you for giving such a fantastic uh, and thought-provoking presentation for answering all those sort of uh, fascinating, interesting questions. Thank you to our questioners uh, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, it's been fantastic to have you here. Um, and this is the third of the four uh, webinars, the final one uh, brings this sort of series to a close, takes place on Thursday, where we're talking about pro-environmental behavior, uh, the impact on the environment and sustainability. So uh, I hope you'll join us uh, for that. Uh, and just before you go, there'll be a pop-up on your screen asking you for some feedback for today's event for the whole series. It'd be great to get your thoughts and, uh, uh, on that. And of course, uh, yeah, um, if you're watching this on uh, online uh, post event, uh, feel free to get in touch with us. If you have any questions, uh, we will do our best to sort of uh, uh, con yeah, respond and sort of uh, give you our thoughts. So uh, we'll wrap it up there. Thanks again, Tom. Uh, and thank you everyone for your time.